Hello, friends. Welcome to the summer of 23. And just a couple of guys with your host, Pat Crimmins, and yours truly, Ray Rogina. We are in our second year, and as you know, we talk everything. I mean everything, because today is a special treat, as we have two interviews. We first invade the world of dance and ballet and have a conversation with Linda Cunningham, a Fox Valley resident who has been involved in the industry as a dancer, producer, choreographer, business executive, and instructor. Linda will join us shortly. Later, we provide a sit down with St. Charles resident and author Bruno Hilgart, who talks about his book, French Fry Leadership, an accounting of the principles he gleaned from years of experience in the fast food industry. All of this right around the corner after a word from one of our fine sponsors. Stay tuned. At McNally Heating and Cooling, we understand that customer satisfaction starts with arriving at your home on time. Your service technician will apply the same attention to detail and quality workmanship to every job, large or small. We offer upfront, honest pricing, and we'll make sure the job gets done right from start to finish. From furnace and air conditioning service, minor repairs, or total equipment replacement, we do it all. Give us a call or find us online and let the luck of the Irish work for you. Well, we're back and very pleased to have uh, Fox Valley resident, Linda Cunningham, a business executive, professional choreographer, producer, instructor, and artistic director in the field of dance and ballet. And Linda, welcome to Just a Couple of Guys. Thank you so much, Paul, Ray, Patrick. It's an honor and privilege to be asked to be on your podcast. I appreciate it very much. Well, let's start with a little bit of a foundation question here. Uh, uh, this is our first air time in the area of dance. So let's start by talking about your early career and what developed the passion and talent for dance and ballet. Well, it, and that that's a really, really great question. I was looking at your outline. They're all really great questions. So I appreciate everything where you're coming from and exploring the arts and in the Fox Valley and beyond. I started at dancing at age three, which many dancers back in my day, I'm old as dirt, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> I started at three. My sister was dancing. She was four and a half years older than me. And I would come and watch her dance. And I would be in the back. It, behind like the wall with the like a glass screen and I could get the combinations like at three. So I was like, I begged my parents, please let me take dance. Both of my parents were dance teachers at, as well. Their genre is ballroom and mine is ballet and character. So I begged and begged and begged. And the teacher had said at that time I was too young. And finally she said, okay, we, we will go ahead and give her a shot. I started, my sister quit. I never left it. So it's um, the studio owner back in the day, because I, I lived closer to Chicago. So the studio owner back in the day, I think I'm looking over at some notes here. So I apologize for not looking at the screen right on there. Um, it, you know, I loved everything about it. I, I loved the freeing nature of it. I loved the mathematical nature of dance it's because every it is kind of mathematical i i mean my my head i can still remember choreography from when i was like three i mean I, it's really weird i get my my brain's like a grid and i can pull out different sections of choreography and it just sticks with you and stays with you that's the one real big common thread that dancers have beyond some other things is a good memory. So I was very, very inspired from the emotional and what I like to call at almost spiritual standpoint of dance because it's very moving. You know, like if, if you all, all you gentlemen have played sports or whatever, it's endorphin flying, it's chemical, it's real. You, you get into it and you get excited. And it's the same thing with dance, only more on the emotional 
spiritual side, if you will. Your your entire career, or most of your career, focuses on the teaching of dance and ballet. But what about Linda Cunningham, the performer? Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about your early days as a performer? And what were right. you involved in? What, what production were you involved in? Oh, my gosh. Uh, where do I begin? Well, you know, I started... Yeah, right. Thank you, because I could go on and on. Um, you know, like I say, my first recital, your early studio show, if you will, was at three. And back in the day, I was like a little alley cat. And I can remember the little choreography, choreography from that. And either young dancers get scared of the stage right away, or they love the smell of the grease paint. And I bought right away. I started... I, actually, my first television gig, if you will, as a dancer was on WGN when I was 12 doing Sugar Plum Fairy. So back in that day, that was a big deal. And that my then teacher, uh, her name was Zaki Lebowski. I studied with a lot of Slavic Russian teachers. If my parents being so strong into their dance discipline, I had to leave the my first home school the teacher said i have to leave at five and move on and that's what a good studio owner will do they will not keep you they will help nurture you to move on to a more technically driven school so then i i started performing ballets my one of my favorites is probably swan lake and believe it or not i do love nutcracker i know a lot of dancers i've done so do. many i can't i can't even count it anymore from producing to directing to choreographing to performing I, I i don't even know how many anymore i've lost count but i there's something so mystical and magical about it i do i do love character and i started character when i was eight years old character dance is russian spanish Serbian, and that's where dance started was in Europe, and it got refined and came over to the United States. And it Pat, came to what we now know as ballet. Um, well, it's good to have you here, Linda. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I you. wanted to talk to you a little bit about your career as a teacher, especially at the State Street Dance Studio in Geneva, and uh, the fact that you were a director of many productions. If you could talk about that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, th that's kind of an interesting, interesting story. I was talking to Ray about this before. This was really wild. If you think about this back in the day, I, I started teaching my first job ever in life. I was 14 years old teaching ballet to adults. So that came very easy to me when I was five years old and living at home with my parents, I would teach neighborhood kids dance on my patio. So that must have just been innate in, in me. And I loved it. And I really felt the love of nurturing the artistry of dance. That that was a real high for me. So when I first did full-length productions in Geneva at State Street Dance Studio, when I well, let me back, digress for a second here. When I first opened the studio, my father, who is a staunch uh, ballroom traditionalist, he said, You should have done it 20 years ago. I says, Oh, dad. And my mom goes, I always knew you would. So it, it's kind, kind of an uh, interesting uh, dichotomy there. I, I love doing full length productions. So even the littlest dancer, even if they're making a cameo, can realize what it's like to do a full length show, not just go on, no disrespect to those establishments that do this, but you know, and I'm sure you've done this as a father or grandfather or whatever, you've gone to a show and you get, it's like a cattle call. You get one piece on, they come off. One other piece on, they come off. But I like doing a story. I like the whole shebang. And so I was the first in the area, in the Fox Valley area to do full length productions. And I absolutely love bringing in professional dancers. So even the littlest dancer to the very proficient high schooler and beyond can start partnering and working with people that are professionals in the world that making a living at it 
And I was very, very careful of always who I picked professionally speaking. They had to have the demeanor to be able to work well with kids. And not just that, I love bringing in adults. Like I would put you in the party scene <laughs> just looking at I I love as a director. I You're talking about Ray here, scene. right? You're using I, Ray as the example. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. and I and I see people all the time, and it, it happens to. Me. Matter of fact, at uh, Del Nor Health Club, there is a wonderful teacher there that teaches Zoom. I'm not excuse me, Zumba, and it's um, called like Groove or something like that. I just connected her with a colleague of mine who has a professional hip hop company, and she's going to do that now, along with her job at Del Nor. I love seeing people that have something that is worth nurturing and given a gentle nudge to. So that that really works for me. And then another thing too with State Street Dance, we were a very technically driven school. That's how I was trained. That's how I grew up and I know it works. So we had what's called a ballet training program. So you had to start ground one and work your way up. And it's hard work. And as far as students that went on to be professionals, absolutely. And it's it's not a one in a million. It's the passion and the perseverance. And of course, the body, the, the work that you have to put in. It's an You're a major athlete. It's really hard. It's a foreign language. It's French. It's hard. Yeah. Well, let me yeah. stop you there. Let's talk a little bit about what the State Street Dance Studio is. Are you affiliated with them anymore? I ended up having my Oprah-esque moment in life, and I gave it, didn't sell it, I gave it to my operations manager, who is a real peach, and I wanted to, she's much younger than me, and I wanted to give her a shot at the title and kind of go on to bigger and better things and whatnot. And unfortunately, sometimes when the founder leaves, some of the mojo walks out the door and a lot of customers then, you know, want to try other. That's why I'm still other... in the podcast, Linda. We don't want to lose our luster. Well, I get you. <laughs> I get you, but I get you. So I, so she, unfortunately they didn't make it. However, I'm very excited about this. The one of my teachers that used to work for me, Elise Flagg, who danced with George Balanchine himself and was trained under him, she now is in my studio. So I'm very happy and blessed to have that happen. It's just so for people who aren't from Geneva or or necessarily uh, the Fox Valley area that would know about right. the studio. What is the studio? Just tell me briefly what it is. Well, you know, that's kind of a neat story, too. When I was looking around for a space, I love Geneva. I've always been smitten with, rom I say romantically smitten with Geneva. I don't know what it is. I live in Batavia. We've been here for 29 years, May 31st. I don't know why I remember that date. But I've always been romantically smitten with Geneva. And I was looking around, looking around for the space. And one day I was having a lady lunch with myself and I, this was back in the day, and I drove by and I went to the Fargo Theater building and it was for rent. And I said, that's it. So there was never um, a second floor. It stopped at the projector screen up there because it used to be an actual theater, you know, for movies and stuff like that. So I built out the entire second floor and put three studios in there. And then my office was up north facing State Street and then, you know, had an office in dressing room and dressing room for the older company girls and boys, whatever, in the back. So I, I saw the vision like that nice. and there was no turning back, none. And uh, the, the next question, I guess, is uh, you've been involved in productions. And one of the productions that people know, most know about is uh, the Nutcracker. 
and you were specifically involved with the Nutcracker in Fox Valley. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh boy, yeah, we we <laughs> did so many Nutcrackers. Um, you know, let me check my notes here. You know, we did Nutcracker at um, well, we did we did so many different shows at different theaters down at the Athenaeum Theater in Chicago. We were invited to be on the big one downtown. Um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Chicago you know, like, Ballet Conservatory. Well, that was a huge that was a huge one. Um, Ray, were you in any of these performances or productions? No, I thought I you had. Not. What's that? No, I was not. You were in something, though, weren't you? You were in some production. Were you? No, Pat, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was the St. Charles Singers. You were. You did something. Thank you. But now we get. We, we talk about plays. Yes, I've been in plays, but not dance and ballet. Oh. Well, well you and you know, the funny thing about that, Ray, is when you're in a ballet, there is so much acting in it. And that's why I would always have the adults in like Sleeping Beauty, right. Don Quixote, I, I, Swan Lake, what I, and and you could you could be just a adult in the background in bring your schwad of ear and bring your acting ability. So Ray, look out. I got my eyes on you I, now. <laughs> uh, I'll always consider discussing it. I hope Pat will too. I will uh, tilt at a windmill. You know me, Ray. Any windmill I, I, I see. Know, I know you very well. Uh. So we we did we did um the Nutcracker at the Batavia Fine Arts Center, the Norris um theater and the Paramount Theater. We did a ton of shows at the Paramount Theater. Um, but now with their Broadway series, you, you can't even get right. in, get in, a, get on, a, get in on that anymore. And then Chicago Ballet Conservatory saw a tape of one of my shows and the producer, wonderful lady named Tressa Muller, who is actually one of the gals that got me connected with the Chicago National Association of Dance Masters. So she saw my tape called me in for an interview and we had like a two hour lunch interview. And I told her, I said, I said, trust, I said, if you want big, that's me. I said, if you don't want big, you don't want me. Cause I don't know any other way to go. I, I, I feel that you have to go big to show your audience and your dancers something really entertaining and special. And to me, Nutcracker is so indicative of the holidays, no matter what your, um, if you celebrate Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's just a time of holiday and good cheer and all that good stuff. So the acting ability and all that, it's, it's, it can go anywhere and it's all over the world. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? We you are know, going to take a, a commercial break. And when we return, we want to talk to Linda a bit about the commitment the mm. commitment necessary to perfect this fine art. So stay tuned. Hello, friends. This is Ray Rogina. Hey, the Kane County Cougars are back for the summer. The best family entertainment around features sunshine, baseball, and fireworks through Labor Day with great food, entertainment, giveaways, and running the bases after every game. There's something for everyone at a Cougars game. And Thirsty Thursdays feature $2 beer, pop, and hot dogs. And on Sunday, a $15 ticket gets you $15 right back in concession cash to spend at the ballpark. What a deal for you baseball foodies. Come visit us at beautiful Northwestern Medicine Field this summer for your dose of sunshine, baseball, and fireworks. And make your family memories today. We're back. And, and Linda, you know, we're pleased to talk to you today, but I know for a fact that you've had interviews and conversations with a number of journalistic outlets Uh, uh Talk to us a bit about some of the engagement you've had and just describing what you're doing today at a much higher level. You know, it's it, it was 
unbelievable. I'm a true believer in making connections with people. When you're really passionate about something, people can feel it and sense it and know that you want to shout it from the rooftops. And I made, I personally made connections with uh, ABC and WGN. We were on many, many times with interviews and I would bring dancers down and, and that was kind of, it was kind of unheard of to be able to get in and do that kind of thing on television you, to pay for that. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. So it was a real blessing. And the press picked us up. And again, I got so friendly with everybody and just told them I would put press releases out and they would come to me and say, oh yeah, we're, I, I mean, I have boxes and boxes and boxes of all the wonderful press that we have had in radio and whatnot in it's when people understand in the business of media that you really are committed to do what you love, they want to share that with other people that would be excited about either going to see a production or be in it or have their son or daughter be in it, something of, of that nature. So I've been very blessed to have a lot of airtime with all of that good stuff. In regards to Nutcracker, um, I want to say we were also one of the first to bring full orchestras it, absolutely in the Fox Valley er, area. So Elgin Symphony Orchestra, yeah. who is phenomenal. So, you know, we were just really, really blessed. And I think it's very important even for the younger dancer, whether you're a novice or certainly a professional to have an orchestra and realize yeah. how that all rolls. And it's super exciting. And I love bells and whistles and tricks and aerial work and all, all, all the stuff that makes shows fun, kind of circus ole, but I, I'm a true traditionalist when it comes to shows and uh, I know some people have seen the uh, the Black Swan with Natalie Portman and uh, oh yeah, they kind of understand that there's a lot of physicality involved in <laughs> in dance. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the discipline involved in getting yourself ready to to compete or for want of a better uh, word to participate in dance. You have to be you have to be in shape. You have to be ready to go. How do you get yourself there? What do you have to do? Well, I'll tell you, Patrick, you know, when I was young, I would go, you would take class six days a week and then rehearsal all day on Sunday. It's, it's no joke. You have to stay in condition. It's a lifelong process that, I mean, like for, I mean, you know, at my age, even I still have to dance five days a week, not just because I shouldn't say I have to, I want to. It right. makes me feel good mentally, spiritually, physically. If I stop, my whole body would be <laughs> like atrophied. It is very hard work and you have to stay with the consistent training because of the fact that, you know, your feet, you know, injuries can happen. You've got to learn how to work through them. In my career, I've had only two broken toes. So that was pretty, that was pretty good. Yeah, no, that's not bad. But I've had dancers that have had hip surgery, knee surgeries, and they work it out and they come back. Right. So, yeah, you, it's it's something that you cannot, as a professional or a re, if, if you want to be performing at a high level, you have to stay with the training. And it's that's great it. exercise. I mean, I see it all is. these these stars, Dick Van Dyke, all these people that live till they're a hundred years old. So it's got to be the dance, right? Oh, absolutely. And it, and you know, super good cardio and it just, and it lengthens your body and it, it it's very, very good. Whether you're a man or a woman, it doesn't ma matter. I mean, it, you know, it's hard work and the men have to make us girls look really good because they have to lift us. So right. 
it's very difficult, you know, so it, they have to not only be beautiful from the standpoint of their artistry and their hands and their feet and legs and whatnot, they have to be rock hard, strong to lift yeah. them over their head. It's hard. You know, Linda, we read about the millions of dollars made by uh, professional athletes. What can a talented ballerina or uh, dancer belonging to a professional troupe make today? Well, you know, it's about 190000 a year. Like, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, in, if you're in a, a good ballet company, if you're not, if it's a more smaller one, 100 for sure. Um if you're in a good one, you can get three to five thousand dollars per performance because it's very, very demanding. I mean, if you saw these dancers come off the stage, you'd be like, oh my gosh, it's crazy. I mean, they're just dripping wet, and then they got to get back out and do it again. So <laughs> to the next piece or whatever. So but there's also the big market of merchandise, right? The shoes. <laughs> oh, well, see, when you're with a company, the company will pay for you know, the dancer's point shoes. And, you know, you, you have a whole, like I used to have my wardrobe mess, mistress, Penny Anderson, who actually owns Dancer's Dream in Geneva. And um, you have a whole wardrobe department that takes care of all that. And then they get all of their shoes, you know, as part of their package. But yeah. Point shoes are very expensive and you have to hit, you know, dancers go through them and all sorts of ballet slippers like crazy. And then character shoes, if you're going through that. So it's, it's a lot, but you get compensated for that. Um, do you mind if I back up a second? Go ahead. I was going to ask okay. about, I was going to ask about the lifestyle of the, uh, of somebody that belongs uh, to a professional troupe as far as travel is concerned, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want me to go there now and talk about that? Go right ahead. Okay. So as far as the travel goes, like, for instance, I have this one beautiful dancer. Her name is Isabel. She started with me in at State Street Dance Studio when she was three. She is now in her 20s, and she's she went to Milwaukee Ballet. She She's now at her third ballet company, and she's doing it. She's making it. And supporting herself and she's been kind of all over the country so sometimes you have to kind of pay your dues when you're younger if you are uber uber uber, uber talented you will be blessed enough to get into an abt new york city ballet bolshoi this and that which that's where i was going to kind of go back to is the bolshoi question because i know you had had that that was something that you wanted to talk about that state street we were the first entity to have a ballet dancer she was like 12 go to brazil for three weeks and train with the bolshoi ballet they're the best in the world i have so many articles about it we were written about it. i'm not trying to sound pompous it's a blessing and a good thing. And people should know that when you go to a technically driven school, whosoever that is, look for the that type of work that they can help guide you and do these terrific opportunities. Is it safe to say that somebody who's in a troop, though, is on the road a good part of the year? Um, well, you can be. You can either be on the road or in your home state. Right. And then also, if your director will let you do guesting, oh my gosh, you're all over the place. I mean, Abigail Simon, who is a prima ballerina that I've used many times out of New York and ABT, um, she's living in New York and has been for a long time. She was with Joffrey here in Chicago for 10 years. She's been all over. She did American in Paris. You know, I mean, one was in Paris, you know, so it's, you can, you can kind of go all over. So it's a beautiful, magical world. A lot of work. A you lot and I of work. Talk, Linda, you and I talked about this at the health club before. I, I, I can't help but ask this question only. This goes to Linda Cunningham, the teacher. So now we have a parent here in the Fox Valley and 
uh, you're running a dance studio and and they bring this young child into your dance studio and, and say to you that they they really feel that their daughter or son has talent right what's the, what's the first step for linda cunningham when you hear that as far as evaluation is concerned and then moving forward from there a it depends upon the age if it is Elementary, dance... elementary school. Of... Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you're already, you know, your body's already a little different. So from when you're three and like a rubber band for when you're 12 and in middle school. So I would need to, with the parent's permission, to sit down and talk to the dancer and take a look at some really common things like they're called frogs, butterflies. So I can see where their hip flexors are. You do need to have more narrow hips and certain things will help you to be able to get your leg up and maintain that leg up. So, you know, certain things need to be looked at. They can always be worked at worked on and you can always be a beautiful dancer your whole life and not be a professional and i need to see where their head's at and more importantly where their heart's at because if it's like being a painter or a composer if you don't have the drive you're not going to be able to handle this kind of work so if you have the drive and just want to be a phenomenal dancer that you're doing it because you love it or like it fine no problem but and if you want to go pro then we got to kick it up a notch like i notches. guess it's i guess that some parents and you probably have encountered this overestimate the talent of their child you think well, <laughs> I, I, yes i do think but i, I want to say it <laughs> i like where you guys are going uh that's so funny well you know and everybody and I respect this and understand this. Everybody feels like their child is the creme de la creme. And I always honor that. However, and I, I believe I shared this story with you. And I, I was heartbreaking, broken, looking, looking at this one child that, would, and she was in middle school, was coming constantly. The mom was you know, really pushing. And I saw it and I'm like, this kid doesn't want to be here. I knew it with all the fiber in my body. So I finally called the girl in my office. I says, honey, I said, I'm really getting the feeling that dance is not your thing. What do you love? She said, Miss Linda, I love to sing. <sighs> so I called the mom in my office that day. And I said, with the now the daughter's in there and there were tears and of uh, you know but it was a good thing i said i can't take another dollar from you because she wants to sing put the money in voice lessons and they did and i couldn't have been happier about that that was a true blessing it, it, absolutely and i know you want to talk a, a minute about the upcoming Chicago Association of Dance Masters, which yes. takes place at the end of this month. And I think you're involved in that to some extent. Yes. And before I do that, with your permission, Ray, can I read you something that I got from two dancers or would you prefer me not to? Sure. Go right ahead. This is why I do what I do. I had gotten a letter. I oh, I have boxes, hundreds and hundreds of letters and cards and whatnot. And when you're a teacher... Um, it inspires me to be a better teacher, director, and producer. So I had gotten a card from an adult that called me a muse. And that really resonated with me. And a muse is like the art of inspiration, which ironically enough, I never even thought about at the time, was the tagline to State Street Dance Studio, the art of inspiration. It's about inspiring others to find their beauty. So this one dancer writes me, I won't read the whole letter, but she says, my life has been very stressful for weeks. Some people think that the Nutcracker is just adding 
to the list of stressful things, but I don't think that at all nutcracker is my reward. It is a feeling that I fail to describe with words that is so beautiful. But I think that when I put on my costume and let ourselves fall into the stunning score, we can look deeper into the story and the origins of the characters. We can imagine ourselves being them. This is what brings characters to life. This is why people say Nutcracker is enchanting. I've loved every millisecond. Thank you so much, Miss Linda. Now let's dream in color because I always liked to have themes every year and mine that one was dreaming in color. And one last one here is this was given by a girl that I really felt she should be Clara, which is the lead Nutcracker. She said, this year you have brought that feeling back. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you, Miss Linda, for bringing me home. You have been my rock through this entire journey. You gave me a shoulder to cry on when I felt like I was falling apart. You were there with me with fist bumps. You were there helping me to come together. I have bonded with you in a way I have with no one else. You have become my director and my best friend. You have completely changed my life because of it. So that's the kind of thing that is worth a million gazillion dollars. Uh, and Linda, I got to tell you, Pat and I, we talked about this beforehand. We had a little trepidation thinking about having have a dialogue about dance and ballet. And you certainly have kept uh, kept it real level and easy for us to, to dialogue. And we really appreciate you taking time to talk about a discipline that uh, certainly requires uh, a lifelong commitment. It requires uh, a lot of uh, tenacity and uh, dedication and artistic expression. And we just can't thank you enough for, for joining us today. So thank you a bunch. I am so appreciative. You know, there has been a few people in my life that have been my inspiration, my teacher, Zaki Lebowski, my best friend, Jackie Chambers, my husband, Kurt Cunningham, my daughter, Ashley, our son, Decker from up above. So they are true inspirations and loves for this art. So I thank you all, Paul, Ray, Patrick. Thank you. See you on the dance floor. All right. Oh, yes. <laughs> for sure. All right, we're going to take a small break and we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Hello, friends. This is Ray Rogina. You face technology challenges every day that threaten to steal business, compromise data, and bring your business down. Without a good partner to help protect from phishing, ransomware, viruses, data breaches, employee turnover, and cybersecurity threats, your business is at risk of losing everything. TechWorks has been the trusted IT partner to Fox Valley businesses for over 20 years, keeping systems secure and providing extraordinary customer service, helping your business grow. Call TechWorks today at 630-482-2227 or visit www.techworks.com. That's TechWorks with a Q. TEQ works and see how TechWorks IT service can transform and secure your business. We are back. And as you can see on the screen, uh, the handsome gentleman uh, to my left is uh, Bruno Hilgard of St. Charles, uh, a St. Charles High School graduate, I might add. And he roamed the halls while, while I roamed the halls. Uh, Back a number of years ago, I'll let Bruno decide whether he wants to tell us how long ago. Bruno, <laughs> first of all, it's great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I, it's 40 years ago this month I graduated high school. Oh, man, yes. you're killing me. Time really flying here when we're having fun. And uh, speaking of having fun, I'm holding up his book, French Fry Leadership, How to Attain Profits Through Serving People. Bruno has written this book. And I guess the opening question, Bruno, to get us started would be a little bit of your backdrop in St. Charles growing up, and then the, the, the road traveled to get to this point where you're involved in fast food management over the course of your career. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Yes. Um, 
I did grow up in St. Charles. I currently reside in St. Charles, raised my family in Geneva for 30 years. So I had to be a Viking for a, a while there where my kids were in high school. But um, I uh, graduated high school and did not go to college. It was blessed to be a part of a growing franchise. Uh, I started working there when I was a junior in high school. And then uh, we, in the, the uh, fall of 83, we opened our second location. And at 17, I became an assistant manager. Then at 20, I was blessed to get my first opportunity to, to run a restaurant in Elgin at our third location. And then uh, from the age of 30, uh, I, I worked for 16 years as the face of the franchise. Uh, and the uh, owner that I worked for, uh, Bill Gill, he understood the value of investing in his leaders. So I was uh, having a lot of uh, game-changing moments early in my career, going to seminars and and uh, leadership courses and classes that were week long. We, we never even talked about Whoppers and French fries. We talked about people. And so I had a lot of uh, influential opportunities uh, early on in my career. And then later in my career, I was blessed to have been exposed to some of the best motivational speakers in the world and, and how they, uh, and, and companies that lead in their respective industries on how they uh, uh, source, how they, uh, on board, how they train and retain people. So, you know, I, I've noticed that, you know, there's a dearth of good leadership out there today, sadly, and it's not the leader's fault. Um, many people are put in positions to fail and uh, they just haven't been taught how to lead, motivate and inspire people across all industries. Um, and I use the example, Ray uh, and Paul, that the, uh, just because somebody's good at making Whopper sandwiches and they, uh, are trustworthy, they've been dependable, they're committed, it does not mean they're going to be good at leading and motivating others to do it. It's an entirely different skill set. Well, you emphasize that in your book. You say a good employee is not necessarily a good leader, a good manager. Uh, so I guess the question then becomes one is, as you have workers in a particular establishment who may be looking for a higher position, how do you deal with that? And how do you decide, well, uh, you're good, you're good kid, but not good enough. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like I've had a manager one time who was really good at hitting the fastballs. And I, I know, you know, we're both into baseball, so we can talk about this. And hitting a fastball is one thing. But, you know, when you take on the leadership role of an entire organization or entire department or whatever it is, now you have to hit curveballs. And it's not always easy, easy to hit those curveballs. Uh, companies need to invest in their people. Um, there's such a disconnect from, and I talk about this in the book, there's such a disconnect between formal culture and organic culture. And formal culture is stuff you would see, quote, on paper or in writing, uh, you know, mottos, mission statements, things like that, where we care, we care about you. Uh, uh, you know, if you have any questions or you have any ideas or anything like that, come to us. Our door is always open. And yet, when rubber meets the road and the employee or team member or associate or whatever you, you identify your people as come to the leader and want to ask a question or have a challenge, um, many times they get responses like, well, I'm kind of busy right now. Can we talk about this tomorrow? Or what kind of rate, what kind of idea is that? You know, we can't afford that. Basically they make the employee feel this big. Now, how many more ideas and how many more questions are we going to get from people when the leaders are making people feel that way? So if the leaders aren't living uh, what's on paper, then it's almost worse to not even, it's almost worse to have it on paper because the worst thing you can do in life, in my opinion, in any relationship, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's your boss, your subordinates, your wife, your, your kids, is to overpromise and underdeliver, and let's yet that's what happens all the time. Let's take your specific uh, industry, fast food, mm -hmm. and let's talk about the fact that a lot of your employees early on come out of high school, perhaps summer jobs in college, et cetera, et cetera. How do you keep them motivated when you know for a fact, they're except for perhaps a chosen few, they're not going to any higher level they're using this as a vehicle to gather money for some future goal. 
The same things you would apply to those and the same things you would apply to the people making six figures a year. We all want to know our work is worthwhile. We all want to know our work is important. Now, if you're a doctor or a nurse, you know, you know your work's important because you, you're helping people get well. But at our Burger Kings, we created a culture where, and every company has a culture. The culture is the vibe of a company. And every company has a culture. Uh, but we created a culture where people knew that their work was important. And we framed it around the idea that everybody that came to our restaurants every day came with challenges. Now, we don't call problems problems. We call them challenges. It's a lot about how we frame things, how we say things. It's not so much about what we say. It's how we say it. And so people came to us every day in, in the drive through and at the front counter, and, and, and they, they had the same kind of challenges like we all had, health issues, neighbor issues, husband issues, wife issues, boss, you know, we all have them. And we want those guests to leave in a better place mentally than when they got there. And we only had two and a half minutes or less at the drive through or three minutes or less at the counter to make that happen. But you do it with a sincere smile, with a eye contact with thank you, I'll see you tomorrow. You know, just a little, making somebody feel special. That's all. And, and, the, and the way we did things, Ray, led to, now maybe people might be asking, okay, so what, how, how did you compare to your peers and your, your competitors and such? And we tracked a lot of things, okay? And one of the things that we tracked that always is important to me is turnover and average tenure of our team members. And our turnover was a third of the industry average. The industry average in restaurants and quick service restaurants is two to 300%. So that means if you have 30 people on your staff and your turnover is 200%, that's you're hiring 60 people throughout the year just to keep 30. And that's more than one a week that you're training and spending lots of money on and, and starting over with people. Um, our turnover was a third of the industry average and our average tenure for our early team members was three and a half years. And it's not because they were getting paid lots of money, it's because they were having fun and they were valued and they were appreciated. You, you keep these people, Ray, by catching them doing things right. Anybody can point out problems, but can we find something good? Can we focus on, oh, those pickles on that Whopper are not overlapped. The ketchup is outside in, little in every bite. I used to get excited about hot, salty, crispy French fries. People thought it was nuts sometimes, but you know what? That's what we did. We weren't trying to find the cure for cancer. Thank goodness people do that. We weren't laying pipe outside so our toilets flush in the morning, Ray. I don't know about you, but I appreciate that. But what we were trying to do is create a dining experience, a drive-through experience, and a takeout experience such that people would drive by two McDonald's and Chick-fil-A and a Wendy's and come to Burger King and bite into that Whopper and go, holy crap, why would I buy, why would I stop anywhere else for a burger again? Now, hopefully you feel that passion. Now you, you have to have passion. You talked, you talked in your book and you said, and I quote, I think it's label of a chapter, I have never fired anyone. You say, and your story that you, you tell in conjunction with that is kind of interesting. You talk about the drive through You talk about you checking in at the drive through and then having this conversation with this young woman who had a bad night before and didn't greet you very well. Tell uh, our audience a little bit about that particular incident as it relates to I never fired anyone. They fire themselves. Go ahead. I think as a leader that you, when things go well, you have to pass on the credit to everyone else. And when things don't go well, you step up and take accountability without pointing fingers. And that's very difficult for most people to do. It's so easy to say, well, I don't know why Ray's not doing it. We coached him, we taught him, we, you know, we trained him. I don't know why he's being rude to customers. But the last thing that any employer or leader wants to do is have to fire somebody or get rid of somebody. Because you spent all this time and effort finding them and hiring them and orientating them and training them. I mean, everyone's costing a company a certain amount of money for X amount of time before they're ever making a company money. So the last thing you wanna do is fire somebody. However, my viewpoint is that people fire themselves through their actions or inactions. And again, we never coached the person to be late for work all the time. We never coached the person to steal resources or money. We never coached the person to uh, be rude to the paying customers. I mean, there was no magic money tree growing money outside to pay the bills, including our paychecks. All the bills, including our paychecks, were paid by the money coming through that drive-through window or at the front counter. And everyone knew that. So 
People fire themselves through their actions or inactions. And darn it, we have to start over that whole hiring process, which costs us a lot of time and a lot of money. So the last thing I ever wanted to do was get rid of somebody. Now, with that being said, at some point, if people are not performing, <clears throat> then we have the conversation with them and we let them know if your hours are being cut, now your hours are being cut because we've tried, we've done the progressive improvement plan, we've talked about it, and we want you to leave on good terms. So put me down as a reference, but we're looking for your replacement. Now, uh, we're going to take a small break uh, for a, uh, one of the words, a words from one of our sponsors. And when we return, I'm going to ask Bruno this question. What do you learn over the course of time from your competitors? He's alluded to several that he has. And so what do they... What do they uh, learn? What do they find out about competitors and how does that make them a better uh, uh, player in the marketplace? Stay tuned. Hello, friends. This is Ray Rogina. I'd like to say a few words about my friends at the Karis Group of Restaurants, one of our sponsors. I've been a frequent guest at all of their fine restaurants for years, one of which is Rookies, which has locations throughout the Fox Valley and beyond. My favorite dish at Rookies is the gyros plate with uh, the Saganaki appetizer. oop My wife, she loves the Hall of Fame chicken sandwich. But I can honestly say that I've never had a bad meal there, regardless of whatever I've had to eat. The wings are out of this world, the salads are delicious, great burgers, tacos, all American specialties, and don't forget their pizza. And of course, you can wash this all down with one of their famous Mai Tais. Try them out. St. Charles, Geneva, Elgin, Hoffman Estates, Huntley, and Roselle. Rookiespub.com. I'll see you there. Well, we're back, and uh, we're with Bruno Helgart, author of this particular book, French Fry Leadership. You talk in your book, and you actually devote a chapter to what I call partnering with the partners. Yep. You talk about the relationships you have with a variety of people who either provide you with resources or maybe it's even the public works of the city. Talk to us okay. a little bit about that. Well, our vendors knew that we weren't paying their bills. Uh, again, it was the guests that chose to come visit our restaurants that were paying their bills. We were just the middleman. So everything they did was important in helping us be successful at, at providing that amazing experience to those customers, those guests. Um, so, you know, I, I valued our relationships we had with partners. We didn't always go with the, cheap, the least expensive uh, vendor. You know, it was, there was a lot more to value than just the price of something, of course. And, um, you know, I tried to go out of my way to catch even the vendors doing something right. And it was amazing how dedicated these people were to us. Now, granted, we paid our bills on time. Of course, they appreciated that a lot as well. But beyond, and they, have to ch they didn't have to spend time chasing money. But at the same time, uh, you know, when the when the uh, guy who's working on your HVAC unit at 90 degrees and he's on your roof sweating his butt off trying to fix your unit or maintain it or whatever, and and I I I was pretty involved. I mean, we had nine restaurants, so we had a little smaller scale, and so I knew when every when there were vendors in our restaurants, I was oftentimes the ones who made the call, and I made it a point to try to stop by and appreciate those guys and. And, and let them know that what they do makes a difference. And if they take six screws out of an HVAC panel, that they put six screws back because if they leave three on the roof and somebody steps on it, now we've got a hole on the roof and we're leaking in the dining room and we got an image issue. Uh, and they appreciated that. Um, vendor partnerships, that's what it's all about. And whether it's at a corporate level, like a supplier who's supplying beef patties or negotiating contracts for, you know, uh, ketchup packets or whatever, or at the local level, when you, you hire your landscapers and you hire your repair and maintenance people or whatever, it's a very important to have a good, strong relationship with those people. As I promised, I was going to ask you this question before the break. Uh, what have you learned from your competitors? What positive things do you take back? Did you, did you take back to Burger King that you may have picked up from Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, Wendy's, or whoever. It's interesting that you, you asked that question, Ray, and I really appreciate you, you diving into the book like you have. Um, Chick-fil-A is the gold standard with service. You know, hell, it's my pleasure when you want something. 
But it kind of irks me because we were doing that at our Burger Kings before Chick-fil-A was even in this market. And to be fair, I, I learned these things when I went to the global conventions and I went to the regional meetings and I, I was exposed to companies like Disney, Ritz Carlton, Harley Davidson, and learning how they bring on people and how they retain people. For example, at Ritz Carlton, um, their, their, their team members or associates or whatever they called them were ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And of course, at a Ritz Carlton, you pay more for your room, but you you when you ask for something is, they don't tell you, they don't they don't point to it, they take you. So, like I said, value is more than just price. But um, McDonald's, I mean, let's face it, I, I used to bring a McDonald's during the orientations that we did with our team members. Imagine you're driving down the road in Podunk, Iowa, and you have Bruno's Burgers, best burgers in the valley. You know, Ray's. Uh, chicken sandwiches, whatever, and then you have McDonald's. Where are you gonna go? You're gonna go to McDonald's. Why? Because you know what you're gonna get. There's no risk. It's very consistent. You know what it's gonna taste like. You know about what you're gonna pay for it. And you know, Burger King hasn't always been that way. You know, there's some Burger Kings that are very nice looking, others that need, need a remodel. There's some that operate very well, others very inconsistent. So one of the things I learned was how the value of being consistent. So we tracked so many things from sales to traffic, to speed of service, to turnover, a lot of things that we tracked. And we wanted our restaurants, we don't want you to be a 90 one day and a 50 the next day. We'd rather be a 70 working our way towards the 90 because your guests are going to be trusting your brand that way. And that's what you have at some of our competitors. That's one of the biggest things I've learned from some of our competitors. Now, I tell people this, and I'm sure Paul's got a story or two as well, but I worked for Kroger back in college, and I worked for going against everything you talk about in the book. I worked for a dictatorial manager of the store and a dictatorial produce manager who I worked directly under to provide uh, you know, produce in the, uh, in the store. Uh, despite all that, I, I learned that I had to deal with people and deal with them well in order to keep my job and, and move along. So I learned that. And I think that that went to my uh, what I feel to be a good career as a teacher and then as a government uh, servant later on. My question to you is, did you see, have you seen after the fact, people who did great jobs working with people in your stores move along to greater successes somewhere else? Great question. I, you know, I, I had some twins working for me at one point whose father owned a local construction company in the area and they didn't need to work. They, they lived out West and they had beautiful home and all that kind of stuff. But the father and I had conversations off and on, not, not that often, but he wanted them to learn from someone besides him. And he was so appreciative of, of uh, you know, the, the, the lessons and, the, and the, the values and things that, that, that these, his boys were learning at, at, at my Burger King. I felt honored to always, you know, with the parents. I mean, there were, there were times where, you know, like you say, first jobs for some people um, and they didn't have anything on their resume. So I called their parents as a reference and got to know the parents. And yes, there are people in this area that have made careers out of out of other things, and 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 you've seen commercials probably for McDonald's. They have such a marketing budget where this pilot began his career at McDonald's. This nurse began his career, her career at McDonald's, and it's because the things that you learn at, at a restaurant and in the service industry um, are things you're going to have to do in any any career. You have to have people skills. You have to be polite to people. You have to be uh, on time. You have to be dependable. You have to be trustworthy. You have to have customer. You know, I, I often say people were learning, you know, why do people stick around? Why do people want to come back and work with us? College kids, you know, they call me up all the time. Can I get some hours? It's because they're having fun. They're learning a lot. They're learning how to, uh, about food safety, about teamwork, um, working with people that you might not know or might necessarily not like. I mean, these are things that we're all going to have to deal with at some point. And the sooner you, you deal with it at, at a young age, the more successful you can apply those things more successfully in, in whatever career that you choose. So yeah, I'm very proud of the fact that there are many people who have cycled through uh, my 
leadership who have gone on to have success in, in other careers? Yeah, you know, that uh, that that McDonald's uh, story, uh, you know, the pilot, right, who started McDonald's. I'm still waiting on my phone call for that. Uh, so, you know, if, if, <laughs> if you know anybody, you know, put in the word, right? Okay. I was hired on a two week. I was hired on a two week trial basis, and I never heard back. But so thirty years later, you know. Anyway. <laughs> well, my last question here, uh, Bruno. We really appreciate your time today. Uh, you talk in the book about the fact that not only do you lecture now uh, here, there, and everywhere on, on management skills, but you've had a lot of interaction with uh, lawmakers for this or that reason. Perhaps you can enlighten our uh, audience as to why would a a uh, past uh, leader of uh, a fast food restaurant be interacting with and talking to and lobbying with lawmakers. And maybe you want to put even in a comment about uh, how, how do you feel about lawmakers regarding well, your You know, Ray, you and I, we have had some good conversations with that. But you know what? I was blessed to, the better we did as a franchise, I mean, we were, we were the training franchise for our, uh, our corporate representative. So in other words, she would bring new franchisees on to our restaurants to train them, or she would host uh, training seminars on new product rollouts at our restaurants. Um, we were franchisee of the year in 2003. So the better we did with all our measurable results, the more they wanted to spread the will. So I was asked by the regional vice president, who at the time actually lived in Batavia, to serve on an Ops Excellence Advisory Com Committee. I was asked to serve on a Government Affairs Committee. So I've been to DC four times in my career and we had a, a list of proposed legislation that, uh, uh, that DC was wanting to pass and things that would have made it more difficult for us to take care of our people. Um, I feel so bad for a lot of businesses today. There's so much, so many things they have to deal with and, you know, somebody gets a hangnail and they can call off sick. You know, I, I used to joke with, with new hires that how important it was to be dependable and how important it was to show up for work by saying, you know, you know, see that marquee outside that has two whoppers for $5 on it? I said, you know, we can't put a message up there, Ray, that says, hi, welcome to Burger King. Sorry, your service is slow and your bathrooms are trashed and the employees are stressed out and your, your, your whoppers sloppily put together, but Ray didn't show up for work today. May I help you? I mean, you know, we can't do that. So anyway, I would go to DC and, and, and be in the offices of these senators and congressmen people and talking to them about this legislation. And, and it, was, it was enlightening because I learned from them on why they wanted to pass these laws. And then they learned from us on how detrimental these would be at, in, in some ways to uh, allowing us to continue to take care of our people. And it was like little light bulbs going off over their heads. And again, it's not their fault. Many of them were in their 20s, right out of Ivy League schools and honestly just didn't have enough life experience to really understand, you know, that, oh, wow, I never thought about that. Okay. I had a, I had a 15 minute conversation with Amy Klobuchar one time. We didn't agree on much, but it was respectful. And, and she shook her head a couple times like and I did the same thing I mean it's not I'm not a my way or the highway kind of guy never have been um I I want to learn from people and why why they think the way they think and um I just enjoyed it I met Newt Gingrich I I you know he's a very engaging man and and I was just blessed to be there I just felt so honored to be a part of our government system in that way well, there's this, well, there's, a, there's a there's a great story about George McGovern. To your point about life experience, uh, you know George McGovern, who was in Congress for forever, of course ran for president. Uh, he retired and started his own. He and his wife started a bed and breakfast. That was going to be their retirement activity, and he at that point had to start living under some of the rules that he had promulgated when he was a you know, when he was in power and he couldn't believe it. They went bankrupt. And he said, I never had any idea that all of these regulations, how they impact the running of a business. Um, and he, he said, I couldn't do it. So it, it, unfortunately it came too late for him. Uh, but, but your point about life experiences is really a key one. I and mean, sometimes they just don't understand how businesses work. 
uh, or don't work, as the case may be. We need regulations. We need government oversight. I'm not against that. It's sure. just that where where do you draw the line to the point where you're you're helping so much that you're you're hurting? Right. Yeah. Well, there's no question in my mind that there's a happy balance between some regulations necessary and allowing a business, the captains of industry, to be able to spur the economy with a variety of choices for consumers. Well, I, I agree with you 100%. Time has flown, Bruno, and I know that you're on a time clock today as well. And we appreciate you getting in here and talking to us. The book, French Fry Leadership, Bruno Hilgard, available, first of all, through the publisher, Kohler Books, but also Amazon, Barnes & Noble uh, uh, in Geneva. You probably go to Townhouse Books in St. Charles and order it, and a variety of other bookstores as you're listening to this particular podcast. So, Bruno, let me say in closing... Uh, as a guy who was uh, in the hallways with you 40 years ago at St. Charles High School, I'm proud of you, man. You've done a wonderful job, and I appreciate all you've done. Thank you so much for having me, Ray. You were one of the teachers that made an impact on me. I only had your first semester of business law, and I, I've joked with you that I lost in the first round of your mock trial to the runner-up that year. I hear that all the time. Point, <laughs> by one point, and I took it took exception with you on that. I don't know if you remember that, but... I always respected you and I've always respected you. And I thank you for serving our town of St. Charles as well as you did. And I would like to just close by saying to people who are listening to this, that the book, it, it is based on my 30 years of managing and growing up in a Burger King franchise. However, the lessons and the, 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 the learnings in the book uh, spill over into any and all industries. And I would encourage you, the, ch- the chapters are short. I don't know about you, but when I'm reading a book, I don't like to stop mid-chapter. It's only 120 pages long. I don't want to lecture all day. Nobody wants to be lectured to too long. So I hope people would buy the book, enjoy the book, and more importantly, apply it in their lives. Thank you, Bruno. We appreciate Thank it. Thanks, okay. Bruno. Bye-bye. And we'll be right back. Have Stay a great tuned. day. All right, we're back, and uh, we enjoyed Bruno Hilgard today and uh, the book, French Fry Leadership. Uh, We hope you enjoyed it as well. So for our missing interviewer in action, Pat Crimmins, again, fighting for justice somewhere, and wherever he's fighting, we hope he succeeds. For our illustrious producer and uh, co-host today, Paul Stuckel. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it very much. This is Ray Rogina saying so long and reminding you that the days are longer and the nights are stronger. Uh, At least America sang that in Ventura Highway. And uh, summer is here, vacation time, uh, parties, gatherings outdoors. Just a simple reminder, be sane, be logical, be sensitive. And as always, my friends, be safe. We'll see you next time. Have it your way, have it your way, have it your way at Burger King. May I help you, sir? Two Whoppers, two Whopper Juniors, and four Coca-Cola. And would I have to wait long if you made one Whopper with no pickle and no lettuce? No, sir. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way.